trying to make this quick video on a couple of tables for you this edition. Um, actually sitting in a room, there they go, that loads of clocks are going to go off in and they've got three little doggies sitting around me so they could bark at any moment they see someone outside the window. Let's see how far I can go with this one. So on this one, it's looking at using tables within, uh, within your literature review uh, dissertation. So it's going to be really important that you can use some tables and it's a very clear way of getting messages across to your reader very quickly and efficiently, even if you're then using longer text underneath to explain uh, what's actually in those tables. So the first table that you might want to look at including uh, is the one that actually talks about your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Obviously, the exclusion is the stuff that's outside of whatever you want to include. Sounds really simple. So you might decide uh, to start off with a particular date range. Now, supposing you're um, studying on a contemporary issue uh, within healthcare, then you might find that lots of works have been published on this within about the last five years. So you might decide for your, uh, uh, your time frame, you want to choose the last five years. When you do that, or any of these other categories showing here, when you decide on choosing something, make sure you document it. But then if you need to go back and revisit that, just explain that in the text below the, uh, um, the actual table. So for example, you might say that you're going to go back for the last five years. So exclusion would be anything out of the last five years. But when you actually do your search over the last five years, you might find that you're not getting enough articles returned. So therefore you have to run your search again, and this time extend the parameters, maybe for the last 10 years. Or supposing you're focusing on a particular topic on which there's been a, a major strategy written, um, maybe uh, um, a specific healthcare guidance, like a NICE guideline or um, an act of parliament or something. So there, there, there could be a particular date that you want to hang your study back on because you know that since that date, certain changes have been made. So you can either say you're going back five years or maybe 10 years, or maybe even, as I say, pin it on a particular date. But if you start off with the smallest one, so you go for five years and then you realize there's not enough, so you have to change the date, still document that in your text underneath. So you can say, well, you first ran the search for a five-year period, however, only X number of hits were returned. And therefore, um, to get more, you've had to extend it. So at least you're telling your reader, you're sort of taking them by the hand in a way, and telling them exactly step by step, every decision you make and every change that you've had to address. So the date range is going to be really important. Another one will be to do with the language. Obviously, it's best to stick to whichever language um, you're writing the dissertation in. Because if you decide to use other languages, then you're going to face the problem about who's going to translate any of this. So yes, it's great if you can speak other languages, um, and, and, and obviously, for, for, for many of you, English is going to be your second or even your third language. But if you're writing your dissertation in English, probably best if you stick to articles in English. Because if you do get them written in other languages, and then you have to say in your inclusion criteria that you're going to accept those, you'd have to document clearly who's translating them. Are you doing this? Or are you using Google Translate? Or... Um, is there a translation provided with the particular article? So sometimes you may get them um, already translated. You have to be really clear on all of this. Um, also, uh, choose those that, that you can access for full text, because it's no point you going for them if you're only able to see the abstract. That's not gonna give you um, enough detail that you need. If you find that there are texts um, that you want and you're not getting free access to them, remember you can always request those free of charge through the library service. Or it may be that you have access to other databases. 
Say, for example, if you're working in the NHS, you might have your own individual um, Athens password. And the NHS subscribes to different journals or more journals than the university would. So if you can find that, oh, yes, I've got reference to an article, but I can only see the abstract here. See if you've got access to other databases, maybe through some of the Royal Colleges of Health um, or go through our own library, put in a request for this and they can actually uh, request this from the British Library for you. The final thing I've got on this list, and by by no means is, it, is this um, an exhaustive list. You may think of other things that you want to put in, but the last thing I've got written here would be what type of study or paper are you actually going for? Well, that depends on which type of review you're doing. So supposing your review is based on um, uh, primary research only, then of course you can only access papers that are written as primary research. If it's not that type of study, then depending on which type of review you're writing, you'll be allowed to access uh, different types of um, resources. So uh, you have to specify what you're going to be looking at and then give the rationale for why you're doing it. And that will fit in with the particular type of um, review that you're doing. The next table that, that, that you probably want to put in is going to include your databases searched. So you might have started looking for material by going on to Google Scholar and our librarians um, in the sessions that they teach for you, always explain that, yes, it's it's acceptable to start off with Google Scholar, but there can be some difficulties with this such as the particular device you're using, remembering the types of searches that you're doing. Whereas um, an, a more objective database, such as EBSCOhost, wouldn't do that. So just document exactly which um, databases you're using. And now in the next column, you can see the search terms. So in Google Scholar, you might put in your whole research question or elements of it. Whereas if you're using a specific database, such as EBSCOhost, you can only use keywords and then include those Boolean operator terms, the and, or, or not. Okay, so some of those will widen out your search, uh, some of those will narrow it down, and some will show exclusions. So yes, you want papers on adults, but not children, or you want papers on HIV and AIDS, or just one or the other. So the Boolean operator terms will help you to uh, broaden out or narrow down or exclude. In the next columns, I've got the number of hits. That means the number of articles returned. So if you go on to Google Scholar, you might find that thousands upon thousands of articles are returned. That gives you the idea that, yes, it's worth doing this particular search because there has been a lot written on it. So that's a, um, a really good indicator. So when you go on to the specific databases then, and you're using your key terms, now these are going to be keywords out of your particular question question uh, that you're trying to answer or the, um, the key focus of your dissertation, or if you've looked at some key texts on your subject matter, you might even be using the keywords that have been used in those articles as well. So you decide on which keywords you're going to use, then you see how, number, how many are returned, and then when you go through your process of exclusion, um, you, you, you will end up with a particular number for your study. So say, for example, and I'm just making all of this up, supposing, for example, you try a search on EBSCOhost and you say which databases you're using on the EBSCOhost um, search engine, and maybe you come back with 150. Then you start excluding some. So you might say, well, you've excluded some because they were duplicates, or you've excluded some because they were outside your um, inclusion criteria, so maybe outside of your time frame, or written in another language that you weren't looking at. So when you're looking back at your inclusion exclusion criteria, that's how you decide how to get these numbers down. And then you start bringing those numbers down and down until you end up with whatever number is relevant. And also on this list, you will see that I've put space for um, other databases as well. And that could be other sources. So say, for example, if you're looking at a specific journal, maybe of 
one of the uh, professional bodies in healthcare that produces its own journal, but maybe it's not available on the database, but you've got access to this specific type of journal. So that's where you can list that as another. And in the column that says search terms, of course, the search terms could be different across all of these. So as I say, with Google Scholar, it could be a, a whole question or a sentence, keywords for the database. But then if you're going to a specific journal, supposing it was a particular journal, say on um, paramedic science, and if every article in there is written about paramedics, then you don't need to use the word paramedic because you know it's going to be included in there. So that column that talks about search terms could be different on each and every one of these. Then you need to ask yourself certain questions, um, like a checklist in a way, of whether you did certain things as part of the crucial steps of your uh, research for the uh, um, for your publications. So first of all, did you use the most appropriate, uh, the accurate and relevant key terms? As I say, they could be the key terms used in your um, research question or your dissertation title, um, or they could be the keywords that you found in articles which are similar to the type of work you're doing. So make sure you're using the right key terms. And we've covered in other places how to use truncations. So say, for example, if you're looking for anything to do with nursing, you might just write N-U-R-S and then an asterisk. And that will pick up nurse, nurses, nursing, nursed. OK, so it'll pick up anything that's relevant uh, with those terms. So make sure you are using the most appropriate key terms. And sometimes if you only get small numbers, it could be that you're on the wrong database. Maybe that database doesn't cover it. Or it also could be that you're not using the right terms. So again, talk to the librarians, see what they suggest about which terms are the most appropriate to look for what it is you're actually trying to explore. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes you may have too many and that's going to be OK because you're going to be able to uh, uh, limit those down. And that's what you want is a lot of articles so that you can start working on these and bring the numbers down. If you've got too few, that's when you need to run the search again and start changing your parameters. But it's going to be really important that you spell out to your reader um, all of the steps that you do. Remember, with literature reviews, they're meant to be replicable. Yeah, because if your reader wanted to try and follow the steps that you're doing, they should be able to come up with similar uh, um, uh, results that you have actually found. <clears throat> so make sure that you're being um, systematic in your steps, but also in the text underneath all of this, you can then spell out if you've had to change at all. So as I mentioned right at the beginning, you might have said you're going back for five years and you didn't find enough papers, so you then extended to 10 years and you had to do it again. Just tell the reader exactly what you're doing. And that's it. Believe in yourselves. Uh, best wishes with all of this and hope these little videos are helping. Take care.